Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, as Anna Puma said, I'm from the University of Maryland, Dr. Melissa Hayes Gerke, and I, I teach a lot. So I'm happy to be here teaching in India. This is for my first time in India, in Mumbai. And so I have been here less than nine hours. And so uh, please forgive me if I'm a little jet lagged here to get started. Uh, but what we will be talking today is like curve analysis. And uh, so we're going to be using something that I do use in my classes in the United States, which is Nearpod. So you guys have seen this up here, uh, nearpod.com. This is free for you guys. And when you log in, you just log in with the five letter code. It says to enter a lesson and get into the five letter code. Did you guys, were you guys all able to get into that? And you can see the introductory screen here. Is that right? Is everybody, I'll give you a moment to get into there if you haven't. So nearpod.com and there's a five letter code that you put in. It was a little slow to load for me on the Wi-Fi here, but yeah. You can also do it on your phone. There's a Nearpod app, yes, if you would prefer to use your phone. A lot of my students use their phones, so yeah. Yes, all right. Okay. So give you a moment to get that all set up, and hopefully you'll be able to log in. You can just put sign in with any name. You don't have to create a, an account or a username or anything. You can just sign in with any name. If you were my students, I might ask you to use your real name so I could tell you were here, but I won't be grading you on this. Yeah. OK. Has everyone managed to get into that? Can you give me a nod if you're in, or maybe a no? Yeah. Yes, 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 OK, all right, all right. All right, and so what we're going to be starting today is talking about Nearpod. Now, the thing about Nearpod is uh, I kind of control the slides. So we're going to go into our first slide here, and so I will put it ahead. So you should have moved ahead to the next slide. So you should be seeing what's up here. So we're going to be talking about light curve analysis today. And so I have some learning goals for you. So by the end of this module, you should be able to construct scientifically plausible phase, phase diagrams from a raw light curve containing many epochs. And so I'm going to talk about what I mean by phase diagram here in a moment. You may or may not be familiar with that. And then uh, you should be able to identify the type of variable represented in a light curve based on characteristics of light curves such as shape, period, and amplitude. And so we'll be looking at some example light curves here in just a moment. And then you should be able to discuss some of the physical characteristics of the source based on characteristics of the light curve. And so we'll be getting into that. And then finally, kind of the, the bulk of what we're going to be talking about is some different methods for figuring out periods from your data. So if you're looking at a periodic phenomenon, trying to determine what that period is. And so we're going to, uh, you should be able to use the string length method, the Fourier analysis method, and or the loam scargle periodogram method to determine scientifically plausible periods from law, right, raw, ah, excuse me, raw light curves. And so when I say scientifically plausible, one of the things that you may run into with real life data is that you could get spurious periods or alias periods, which are not the true periods of your data but they can look pretty good sometimes. And so when we say scientifically plausible, you have to be able to interpret your light curve and make sure that it makes sense for the type of object that you're looking at. OK, and so let's get into this, the so first part here. So just to start with the basics, a light curve is a series of measurements of brightness over time. And so you can see that here on this example light curve that I have. We have the time, Julian date, and apparent magnitudes. And so this is the step where you guys are at, because you've learned how to reduce your data, calibrate it, darks and flats, and all of the kind of calibration you're doing. You've learned how to do photometry. So you've gotten magnitudes from your data. And now you have the data over time. And so if you're looking at something that changes brightness over time, and honestly, that's almost everything in astronomy, changes brightness over time, then you want to be able to analyze it. So today we're going to be thinking about more periodic types of objects, OK, that periodically change brightness over time. So you can see that this object is getting brighter, dimmer, brighter, dimmer, brighter, dimmer. Over a pretty long time scale, though, look at that time axis. That's a pretty long period of time, isn't it? So this is a very slow changing variable object. This is a Mira star, OK? So this is a very long changing red giant or red supergiant. 
Okay, but this is just an example of a light curve. So you'll have something that changes over time. Now, you will wish that you get a light curve that looks this good. You know, so this is a good example for you guys because it's very well defined. There's a lot of data points there. So yes. All right. So as we go on here, so when we analyze light curves, we look for characteristic light curve shapes and periodicity. And we're going to come back to this diagram in a couple minutes. And I put this up here just to show a whole bunch of light curves. And if you take a look at the light curves, you can see they all look different. They have different characteristic shapes. And if you look at the time axis, which I apologize, it's a little kind of squeezed out. It's a little small. If you look at the time axis, the time axis is different for different types. So longer periods and shorter period variables here. And so you can see some distinct shapes. So we have the rise and fall, kind of a um, not an exact sinusoidal because there's a steeper rise, a longer fall. Here we have more like a sinusoidal kind of variation. Here we have kind of crazy variations with these ones that are down on the bottom. That's a different type of variable star. And so not as strictly periodic. And you can see that the shapes are not as well defined. So different types of variables have different kinds of shapes. And that's one of the things that you can figure out from light curves. So what I'm going to do next, this is one of the things that we have an advantage with Nearpod, is so I have a number of different slides here that you guys are going to be able to look through, but I want you to have a goal with this, okay? So let me give you some goals. So you'll be able to switch through each of these slides here on your own. And these slides show light curves for different types of variable objects. And so there's a brief description of the type of object, because I'm assuming all of you know at least a little bit of background astronomy on some of these objects, but there's a quick explanation. I want you to take a look through them and think about how do the light curve shapes compare across different types. Okay, so all of the slides here are kind of color coded. They're all different types with the slide background. So how do the light curve shapes compare? How does the amplitude of variability compare for the different types? And how do the periods compare across the different types? And what I mean is kind of shorter versus longer, you know, hours versus days versus weeks. So that kind of time scale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a moment. And I see a lot of you have paired up. So you've, you're kind of working at your desks, and there's pairs of two. I want you to think about this with your partner there next to you and kind of discuss it a little bit as you go through. And I'm going to give you maybe about seven minutes to go through each of these slides and kind of compare them. So you can go back and forth through them, discuss it with your neighbor, and see what you think about answering these. So you can also see these questions. OK, so I'm going to give you about seven minutes to do this. And go ahead and take a look. And then we will talk about it after you come back. I'll ask you guys to report out. So go ahead. Please go ahead and take a look at these slides. OK, one more minute, and we're going to discuss. OK, let's take a look at what we've got here. So we're just going to step through the slides quickly. And so if I show the next one up here, eclipsing binaries. You guys are probably familiar with the idea of eclipsing binaries. So there's a little bit of a description here. And what do you notice about uh, the magnitude changes of eclipsing binaries? So we have, we have up here uh, a baseline magnitude, and then we have the eclipses of various shapes depending on the different kinds of systems. What do you notice about the magnitude changes? About how much do they change in magnitude? Anyone call, want to call out? Raise your hand. Yeah? Yeah. OK, so maybe a magnitude or so. 0.7 to 0.8? OK. Now, is this the magnitude change? No, that's the period, right? Just to make sure you guys are noticing that. Yeah. But the magnitude changes. Yeah, we have maybe a half to one magnitude. So it's a distinct change, but it's not as big as some of the others, correct? Yeah, OK, yeah. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the eclipsing binaries, because this is a more of an obvious source of variability here. 
Uh, the next one, I have a couple slides on this just to show some different variations on the light curve. And so what you can see here is different types of pulsating variable stars. And so this is a little bit of representation, uh, not a physical light curve, but just a representation of how the pulsating variable star is changing in both size and surface temperature as it pulsates. And so are you guys familiar with pulsating variable stars like Cepheids, Arleries, and so on? Yeah, you guys have heard, heard of those? Okay, so I won't talk about that for too long. And I apologize, I noticed when I was looking over the slides on the airplane, I have a couple typos and I didn't have time to fix them and upload it, and so I apologize for that. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you can see how the, uh, the star will get smaller and hotter, bigger and cooler, and so on. Now the thing is, with the, the uh, pulsating variable stars, there's a whole bunch of different types here, and they look different. We can distinguish them by light curves. And so that's the next thing that you guys were looking at. There's a whole bunch of light curves here, but you can see the different shapes that they have. Okay, so how would you say that, uh, I have one kind of uh, variable star here that doesn't belong. That was just because this eclipsing binary row down here, that was included just on the figure and I didn't want to cut it out. So it's not a pulsating variable star, but the rest of them are pulsating variable stars. Do you see that the different types of pulsating variable stars have different sorts of shapes to their light curves? Yeah. So this is one of those ways that we can start to tell if you have a mystery object that you're observing, like with the growth India telescope, you observe this variable object and you find that it has one of these characteristic light curve shapes then you can start to identify the type of object that you're looking at by the shape, okay? And one of the ones that I showed at the beginning that has kind of the crazy light curve down here, you can see now that these are delta scuti variable stars. So they do not have as regular of a period, they're sort of quasi-periodic, and do they have very large variations in brightness compared to some of the other ones? No, yeah, they're much smaller. And so this, the changes in brightness are a lot smaller as well. And so that's, uh, that's more difficult to observe those. Whereas the Cepheids, the Arleries, are very regular and higher, um, higher brightness changes, high level brightness changes. And then here, if we go to the last kind of ver uh, pulsating variable star, I just couldn't fit it on the previous slide, is the uh, Miras. And so you can see that these are well, how do their periods compare to the previous ones, the Cepheids, the Arleries, and the Delta <coughs> Scuties? What are the mirrors like in period? Yeah, yeah, very long period. Yes, yeah, really long period. Ah, yes, and the amplitude is also very high for these stars. So these are generally red giants and red supergiants. So they have the large size, and therefore they're capable of kind of bigger changes in both size and uh, surface temperature. And so then you get a large change in brightness. And so these are pretty amazing. Now these, uh, I have credited some of these, but one, a really good source of variable star photometry is the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and that's where a number of these ultimately came from. And so you can see different kinds of light curves. Now the next type of variable star we'll go through quickly, I have it here in blue, is some rotational variability due to star spots. And I thought this was kind of interesting to think about because I don't know if you guys had thought about that or not. But just like the sun has sunspots, so the darker spots in the sun, as the sun rotates then, we see small changes in brightness, okay? We can see that also with other stars. We just call them star spots instead of sunspots. And so this is something that is pretty neat. So we can figure out rotation periods of stars by looking at this. Now, what do you think about these light curves compared to, say, like the Cepheid light curves in terms of kind of consistency of the light curves? Do they repeat very exactly like the Cepheids do or not? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So depending on the size of the star spots, and do star spots stay around forever? Yeah, no, so they come and go. And so that means that the variability in terms of rotation with the star spots is going to change a little bit. So for a while, there may be some star spots that are there consistently, and so you have this nice kind of uh, brightness 
peak and trough, and then the star spot goes away, and you kind of lose that for a while. And then the star spot comes back, and then you get that for a while. And so those come and go, and so that's something that is very changeable. And one of the things just to point out is that younger stars do have faster rotation, and so they're usually easier to determine the periods for just because we don't have to watch them as long. Okay, and so that's something that can be easier. They also usually have bigger star spots. They're rotating faster, they have stronger magnetic fields, and so that they'll have bigger star spots. All right, so here I have the slide in green. Another type of variable star, cataclysmic variable stars. These are always very popular because who doesn't like explosions? Yes, so cataclysmic variable stars. And so we have uh, the two stars, one's accreting on the other, and when we get the hydrogen fusion on the white dwarf, we get this burst of light. And sometimes it's called a dwarf nova or a nova, so just depending on kind of the scale of that brightness. What kind of magnitude changes do they have here in the light curves? Small, big, in between? What would you guys say about that, the amplitudes here? Okay, pretty big. Yeah, yeah, that's what happens when you get the explosion of fusion on the surface of the white dwarf. You get a pretty big amplitude. Are they exactly repeatable? No. Yeah, and that's one of the tougher things about studying cataclysmic variables is that sometimes they repeat almost with kind of a well-defined period, but sometimes they're very irregular and they don't do that at all. And that's partly because, at least we assume it is, because of the accretion rate from the uh, star that's donating the material to the white dwarf, that it might not have a consistent accretion rate. It might kind of stop for a while or send over a bigger blob of material and so then there's more of it. And so the accretion rate is not very constant. So yeah, so we see that. And then the last type of variable star just that I pulled out, and this is actually not a star, so, but I will, I, I'll tell you why I'm interested in this in just a moment, is asteroids. Okay. And so asteroids, when they rotate, they have an elongated shape. And so when they rotate, we see different cross-sectional areas, like it shows on the diagram. But sometimes uh, it's nice to see it in person. So you, if you imagine that the asteroid has the shape of my remote control here, as it rotates, you see different amounts of cross-section area. So if this end is pointing toward you, if this end's pointing toward you, would the asteroid look brighter or dimmer? Dimmer, yeah. And then it rotates around and looks brighter, dimmer, brighter. And then not only does the asteroid have an irregular shape, but it might have also have albedo variations on it. So the surface may be brighter or dimmer just because of the types of rocks on the surface. And so that will also alter how it looks. And so for asteroids, you can get some pretty crazy looking light curves. So this first asteroid is relatively regular in shape, okay? So we have two peaks and two troughs for the two ends of the asteroid, two sizes. But then like here's another one that has this really kind of weird shape to it. And that is because of not only the irregular shape of the asteroid, but also the albedo variations on that. And it's extremely repeatable. That crazy light curve repeats over and over and over. And so it's, it's something that is really interesting to study. Now, I like uh, asteroid light curves because I teach a class where we, we find, we observe asteroids and look at their light curves, and the students try to figure out the rotation periods based on their light curves. And so that's something that I'm really interested in doing because it's very accessible. And that's something that would be very easy to do with the Growth India Telescope with a few nights would be to observe an asteroid. One of the things that you might notice about the asteroids is how does their uh, rotation period compare to some of the variable stars? Rotation period, generally longer or shorter? Shorter, yeah, much shorter. And so that's something that then can be useful for observing if you don't have a lot of observing time because you can try to see the whole period in a rel relatively short amount of time. Now, some asteroids do have longer periods, but most asteroids tend to have rotation periods less than, say, about 16 hours, and so they're pretty, pretty quick rotators compared to what variable stars do. Now, there's many other types of variable objects out in the universe. I just picked some of the more, I think, interesting ones and repeatable ones that you guys can be looking at. And so now we're going to go on and think a little bit more about how to analyze this periodicity and how to figure out the periods of the light curves. So usually when astronomers are able to determine the period of variability, they also determine the shape of the light curve. And you're going to see in just a moment that those usually go hand in hand, and we'll talk about this as we go on. 
So both the period and the light curve shape are crucial to identifying the type of the object. Okay, and so this is a very useful thing to be doing. So let's look at this. So one of the things that's useful to do is to look at the light curve phased by the peri period of variability. And that's something that a lot of the previous plots you guys were looking at, I don't know if you thought about it or not, they weren't strictly a time axis on the x-axis. Some of them were Julian days or hours or some kind of straight time axis. But a lot of them were phase. Okay, and so this is what we're talking about here. If you take a raw light curve, and by raw light curve I mean the time axis, okay, so no phasing there, and you can see on this time axis, this is for an asteroid, okay, so the asteroid uh, 1906 Neef, and if you look at that raw light curve, well first of all, you can see it's hard to tell what the shape of the light curve is. There's all these gaps in the data. Why do we have gaps in the data there? It's daytime, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, unless you're observing in the Arctic Circle, the Antarctic Circle or something, you're gonna get daytime at some point. So yeah, there's gaps of daytime. So what we can do is if we know what the rotation period is or the period of variability, we can phase the light curve to that. And by phasing it, what I mean is we can split up the raw light curve into chunks, the length of the period. And so the lines here are very faint. I realize they came out very faint, but you can see there's these vertical lines here, and those are chopping up the light curve into uh, lengths based on the period. And then if you take all of those pieces that you've chopped up and you overlay them on top of each other, that is a phased light curve, and so that's what we're showing here. So this light curve has a period of 11.0 hours. So each of these chunks up here are 11 hours long, and then we take them and overlay them on top of each other to make a phase light curve. And so here now the x-axis is phase and not time. So by phase, we go from basically 0 to 1, and it's basically the percentage of the way through the period that you are. So a phase of 0.5 is halfway through the period of either pulsation or rotation or whatever your period of variability is. So 0.5 is halfway through, 0.75 is 75% of the way through, and so on. And then it repeats. Once you get back to 1, you go back to 0. So this is the phase light curve. And once you phase it, it becomes much easier to tell what's happening you get rid of many of those gaps from daytime as long as your period of variability was not like 12 hours or 24 hours so you see exactly the same thing every night then you'll be able to see different parts of the light curve each night and you phase them and you can see the complete light curve once you have a few nights of data okay. so this is a really useful way to be looking at the light curves and that's almost always what you'll see with periodic objects is the phase light curve and so here's how you would compute the phase light curve. So this is a uh, formula that you could use in, say, Python, okay, to figure out the phase light curve. So the phase is equal to the time minus e. So e is the starting point. It's typically called the epoch, but you can just use an arbitrary starting point. Divided by the period, and then you subtract the integer value of that, because the phase is basically the fractional way that you are through the period of variability. Okay, so that's what you'll be using. Now. Let's try this. Okay. Well, uh, sorry, I forgot which slide we're on. We'll try that in another slide. One of the benefits of phasing a light curve is if you phase the light curve with a long time baseline, it will yield an extremely precise period. So this is a, a um, uh, RR Lyrae star from the Intermediate Palomar Transient Factory. And up on the top, you can see the unfazed light curve. And that doesn't look like much of anything, does it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, that once you get a little expertise on this, you can see that all of those kinds of the vertical points that are in a, in a string kind of vertically, those would indicate a lot of variability in one night of data, okay? And then you see those over time, so you can see it's varying quite a bit. Once you phase this to the period here, actually this is a Cepheid, not an RR Lyrae, once you phase this to the period, you can see this nice light curve here and see it's very repeatable over a time span of some 2,500, 3,000 days. It's extremely repeatable. And you can make that very precise. Okay, so when you phase it out to that long, you can get many digits of precision here because of the long time baseline. 
All right, so now we're going to try this. I have, I have a website that I've accessed, and this is just sending you to an Excel spreadsheet. Go ahead and save the Excel spreadsheet. Make sure you save it so you can edit it, because I think at least when I do it, it gives it in like share only mode and you can't edit it. So save it so you can edit it. And I'm going to pull it up here as well. And so what this is, is just, just a little Excel kind of routine. And all you have to do here is change the period in days. And when you change the period in days, you can then hit return on it. So 10.5, I hit return. And it should update the light curve there. So this is the phase light curve. So what I'd like you to do, and you could do this again with your neighbor, is go ahead and explore different periods on this and see if you can find a period that looks good. What would I mean by looks good? Is this looking good? No, okay. So has a nice repeatable light curve. And I'll let you know this is a Cepheid, okay? So I'll give you a couple minutes to explore this and see if you can find a good light curve. I'll give you a hint, you will need decimal places. Not just one decimal place like I have here, you will need more. Okay, so I'll give you about two minutes to play around with this. Okay, so does anybody think that they have found the period? Let me move this over, let's give you guys a chance to tell me. Um, would anybody like to give me a test period to try out? Do you think you found it? 10.12. Okay, let's look at that. All right, what do you guys think? 10.12? 1.52. Sorry, did I mishear you? Sorry about that. All right, 1.52. 1.52. 10.15. Okay. Ah, does that look pretty good? Okay, what looks good about it? Why does it look good? Okay, yeah, less scatter, a consistent pattern to it. Now, this I said was a Cepheid. How many, how many maxima and minima should a Cepheid have in a phase light curve? Yeah, just one of each. Unlike something like an asteroid, which would have probably two of each. So you've got to have an idea of what you're looking for there. So 10.152. Yes, that's very close. In reality, the, this Cepheid, the best fit period was 10.148. Let's see what we get with 10.148, if, if you think that looks better or not. Whoops. 10.148. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty close to each other. Yeah, so this was, this was the one uh, that was given by, or in the catalog for it. So this is just a quick little tool that all it does is make a phase plot. Okay, so it just takes a list of the magnitudes over time and makes a phase plot. You guys are going to be working with something in your Python no notebook that's very similar to this. I just wrote this up quickly in Excel because I can share it easily with you. We'll, we'll, we'll do it quickly. So let's go on. You, you may save this, but I'm going to close this one up here, I think. How do I, there we go. So now let's go on, and we're going to start talking about figuring out periods. So there's several different methods for figuring out periods I'm going to just talk about quickly, and you're going to explore some of these in your Python notebooks in just a moment. So one of the first period determination, determination methods I'm going to mention is called the string length minimization method. Okay, And so in this method, what you do is you imagine <laughs> joining each data point with a length of string. So you do a list of trial periods. Okay, So you just probably will have some idea, oh, I'm looking at a Cepheid. So it's probably going to have a period in this range. So I'm just going to step through a bunch of trial periods within this range and make phase plots for each of them. Once you make the phase plot for each trial period, you imagine connecting each of those data points with a string. So tying a string here, 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 here. So imagine you were just doing that with the Excel spreadsheet you were doing. If you took each of those data points and you joined a string to each of them, if your string is the shortest possible, then that means you've minimized the scatter in your data points, and probably they are ordered into a nice repeating light curve. That's the idea behind the string length minimization method. And so here is the way that you could calculate the string length. It's just based on your phase magnitude. So that's once you make your phase plot. 
and divided by average magnitude. And that's basically to make this unit list. So when you're calculating your, uh, your string length. And then the way you would test this is if you go through all those trial periods, you calculate the string length for each of those. In general, the trial period with the minimum string length is likely to be the true period. Now we're going to come back to at the very end of this, the idea that you shouldn't just trust this blindly. You should take a look at what the program says is the minimum string length, here's the best period. Make sure that it makes sense, especially if you have data points with some scatter in them and uh, maybe some large uncertainties because maybe it's a faint object. The scatter could potentially lead you astray into an incorrect string length, an incorrect period, but that's the idea behind this method. Okay, so that's one of the methods that you'll be trying out. And then another method I want to talk about quickly is called the Fourier, it's called Fourier analysis. And the way that this is used is trial sets of sine curves are fitted to the data. And so a potentially complex repeating light curve shape can be created by combining multiple sine waves. And then each trial set of sine curves represents one true period or repeating light curve shape. So you have to do this again in trial periods. So you would do a set of sine curves together into one trial period. You would try another one, another one, another one, and so on. And so this uh, diagram is just kind of showing how you can get a complex <laughs> shape like this. So this is a repeating shape, but it's pretty complex, OK? And you can do this by combining these different sine waves together. So if you add the first order, second order, third order waves together, you would actually get this complicated curve. So you can represent your light curves with different sets of sine curves and then uh, figure out the period of your data by, again, looking for that repeating pattern. And so this is another one that we're going to try to play with a little bit, and hopefully this is going to work for us. We'll see. OK, so go ahead and go to this uh, web page. I'm going to open it up up here. And the, I don't actually want you to start at the top. So let me show you. I've, unfortunately, they don't have a bookmark, so I can't show you where to go here. So if you scroll down, there's a tool. Keep scrolling down here below this smoothie thing. All right, that's just an example they're doing. And if you go down, there is a tool down here. And now it's not actually going to work because this is Chrome. Yeah, I may just skip this because we're running a little bit late. If you save this website, there are some tools on the website, if you're not running Chrome, because it's in a Flash, I guess, uh, where you can do the sign curves and you can add them together, play around with it. Are some <laughs> of you seeing that? Yeah, maybe some of you have it. Yeah, I don't have it here. But we are, I'm going a little over. So let's go and we'll move on to this. All right. Because the last method is the one that you're going to be using. Ah, so sorry. This is the function representing the Fourier fitting. So when you're doing a Fourier analysis and you're combining all of those sine curves together, each trial period will involve a set of sine waves represented by this kind of generic function. You can see it's just got two, it's got a sine curve, a cosine curve based on time. And so these are the kind of the prototype functions that you will use. Depending on how many orders you want to fit and how many sine curves you want to add together, you'll just add more terms onto this. So this is kind of the, uh, the prototype of how you would do this. So you would add this on to the mean magnitude of the light curve. So you would just find the average of your light curve because what you're looking for is basically variations above and below that mean magnitude. Okay. And then you'll be adding in some arbitrary coefficients for your Fourier coefficients here. Your trial period, so this is what you would step through. So again, if you know it's something like a Cepheid variable, it might range from like five days to 30 days or 40 days in its period. And you're going to step through that. So 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and so on. So this will be your trial period. And then you have the time of your measurements and a zero point time. And then the number of orders this is the thing that is something that you have to try experimentally. So I'm going to go back two pages, two slides here. So you, you will also go back on this. And this is showing three orders of sine curves added together to make this complex shape. So depending on the shape of your light curve, you may need more orders or you may need fewer orders to fit it. In general, the fewest that you can fit with uh, precisely is what you want to do because you have dangers of overfitting, which is that if you add a million sine curves or a thousand sine curves, you could make almost any shape you want to make. 
but that would probably not be very physical. So you want to go with the fewer that will actually fit your data. And for something like a Cepheid, you probably don't need very many orders. For something like an asteroid, which where we saw had that kind of funnier shape to it, then you might need four, five, six, seven orders to fit that adequately. Okay, but if you're getting up into 10 orders or 20 orders, that's too many. Okay, so you're you're looking probably single digits on that. Okay, all right, and so that's what this uh, trial or this kind of prototype function will tell you. Okay, so for each of the trials, you the function is fitted with a linear's least squares fit to the data, and a range of trial periods and orders are fitted. Because when you go through and you try your range of trial periods, you have to try that all with maybe two orders, and then try it again with three orders, and then try it again with four orders, and so on, until you find an adequate fit. All right, and so how do you know if you've reached a good fit when you're doing the Fourier analysis? So you might have a lot of trial sets of sine waves, and it can be difficult to determine which is the true period from that, because you've got all of these sine waves. Maybe it's fitting better or worse. It can be hard to determine by eye. So for each trial, the uh, root mean squared, so the RMS difference between the set of sine waves and the light curve phase to the trial period can be calculated. And the smallest RMS would indicate the best fit. So I have an example here for a set of trial periods. You can see the trial periods down here. Each of these data points is representing one trial period that was tested, and then the RMS. And so you can see here, right here is a very distinct minimum where the RMS is very small, and that indicates a close fit between the sine waves that have been combined together into your complex shape and the actual light curve. And so this would be one that if I looked at these trial periods, I would not examine each of these plots because that would be a lot. Okay, so I would look at this uh, best one first. And the last method that I'm going to talk about in terms of finding periods from your periodic data is uh, another period finding method is to search for periodic signals in the light curve by computing something like the Fourier power spectrum of the light curve. Now, when I say it's like the Fourier power spectrum, I'm going to show you why it's, it's not exactly Fourier, but it's close, so it's similar to that. So Fourier transform of the light curve breaks down the light curve into each of its contributing sine wave frequencies. So this is kind of like almost the reverse of the prior method where we were building up our sine curves and adding them together to make a shape. Now we're taking the shape we have and trying to kind of decompose it. Okay? And so the transform, the Fourier transform computes the power spectrum of the light curve. So how much power exists at the, in the light curve at each frequency? And so this is a really nice kind of demonstration of what we mean by this. So here is your light curve. This sideways thing, they're trying to show it three-dimensionally here. So this sideways light curve, this red complex shape is your light curve over time. Okay, so it's the raw light curve. It's not phased. And if you were to break this down into the component sine waves, you would have this wave, this wave, this wave, and they are at different frequencies. Each of those three component waves has a different frequency. So your light curve has power at those three frequencies. And so that's what this is showing here. This is the output of your Fourier transform, is the amount of power versus frequency. So here's a lot of power at this frequency from this wave. Here's a lot of power at this frequency from this wave, and this frequency from this wave. Okay, so now we're looking at if there is a lot of power at a certain frequency, that frequency may be representing the period of your variability. And so if we take a look at this, the more of a contribution a sine wave of a particular frequency makes to the overall light curve, the larger the power that is computed by the Fourier transform. And I have a couple examples here. So here are what I call clean signals, as is there's no noise in these signals. So they're kind of like you might see it in an oscilloscope or something and analyze those. So clean signals. And so here's the waveform and here's the power spectrum. I apologize, the, the text is a little bit hard to read there. But the waveform is on the left and the power spectrum is on the right. So you can see there's one frequency in this waveform and here's one spike in the power spectrum. There's one frequency, one spike in the power spectrum. Here we have a different frequency, smaller amplitude, so smaller power here, but same frequency. And now here we have combinations. So there's two waveforms that have combinations of different frequencies to make that shape. And here you can see the amount of power at each of those frequencies. Okay, so that's the output that we get from our Fourier transform. 
Now on the right, I have just some examples of signals that do have noise. So these are more realistic in the sense that you will have noise in your data. Yeah, so this is kind of the idea that it's not going to be perfectly clean, your Cepheid variable or your asteroid or whatever you're looking at, it's not just going to have one spike because you're going to have data points that are not exactly representing the object. And so there you go. And so here we can see then the time series and then the Fourier spectrum. So here, this one has basically no signal to it. There's no periodic object. It's just random noise, as it says here. And here you can see pretty much no spikes in the power spectrum. This next one has a strictly periodic signal and random noise. But I have to tell you, looking by eye, does it look very different? No. And that's what a, power, or a Fourier transform in the power spectrum is good for, is pulling out things that you might not be able to tell by eye. And so over here in the power spectrum, we see that there is a spike here at this frequency. And then we've got this kind of forest, which is the noise. Okay. And then the last one, quasi-periodic signal plus random noise. So quasi-periodic meaning that it doesn't repeat strictly at the same time every time, but with a similar period each time. So something like the stars that are rotating with the star spots around them, where the star spots kind of come and go, that might be kind of quasi-periodic, because the star spots will not always be there. And so you can see how it will look in the power spectrum. Now, a classic Fourier transform analysis requires the data points to be evenly spaced in time. And again, the reality is, for you know, astronomy observations, you're not going to be able to evenly space all of your observations in time. Yeah, that's just not going to happen. Weather is the thing. Yeah, so weather, daytime, and so on. And so the type of Fourier transform algorithm called the loam scargle periodogram was developed for unevenly spaced data. That's typically what astronomers use. And do the formulation approximations in the algorithm. It calculates an estimate of the Fourier power. It's not exactly the same quantity as a formal Fourier transform, but we use it in the same way. Okay. And so it will indicate the most powerful frequencies. And so here's just an example of kind of this process. And this is something that you're going to be working through in the Python notebooks in just a moment, is you've got an unfazed light curve. You are going to get some practice phasing the light curves. But even if you have an unfazed, you can use the loam scargle periodogram method to calculate then the power spectrum. So here is the frequency across the x-axis and then the power here. And so here you can see, oh, my cursor is right on it even, the periodogram with the highest powers at 0.61 days. So then if you test your period by phasing the light curve to that period, you can see here the phase light curve. And it looks like a very nice, repeatable shape. And this is an RR Lyrae. Okay. So you always want to test your data. and Don't just trust what the maximum power is or whatever the string length <coughs> minimum is. You always want to look at it. So the pseudo power spectrum may show power at other frequencies. And this could be for a number of reasons. So first of all, we talked about there could be noise in your data. So yes, so that's one of the things that could be it. Harmonics in the data or windowing of the data. So harmonics being that you'll probably see power at half of the period and twice the period of whatever your object is. And so that's the harmonics. And then windowing of the data. One of the things that astronomers often run into is we can only observe at night. And so that means that you tend to have data that are all in one period of time, and then you have a big gap, and then you have another set of data. That's the windowing of your data. And so sometimes that can, pre, um, that can create kind of false power in your power spectrum. So you have to watch out for that. And so here's just an example of a more kind of realistic periodogram where the line is representing the, the absolute maximum power in here. And so that period is 0.648 days. And if you check that out and you phase it, then yes, that looks pretty good. It's an RR Lyrae. But you can see a whole bunch of other power spikes here. And some of those are at harmonics, so like this one and this one. And some of those are at noise. And so there's other contributions for that. So it may not be totally obvious what your best period is from that. And that's why you have to take a look at phasing it.
So here is, if you want to know the equation for loam scargle, this is it. It's going to be in your Python notebook. So you'll be able to manipulate it there. But this is how the loam scargle periodogram is worked out. And again, it has a bunch of uh, sine curves here, and you're, you're decomposing it that way. And uh, magnitudes of the individual data points, the time it was observed. And then there is a uh, shift, or uh, uh, making sure that the result is invariant with a time shift. because. Your resulting period should not depend on when your starting point was. And so this is what you will be working with in a few minutes on here. And this is one of the things I often tell my students in the States when we're, we're working on this. This is something computers are really great at. If you want to do this by hand, this would be very, very difficult. But putting this into your program and then asking the computer to chunk through it and do many trial periods is much easier. And so that's something that's really good about this. OK, so just a couple last comments. When you're searching for the true period of variability of your object, you must ensure that the period is not an alias of the true period. OK, so an alias period is a false period that's usually related to the true period or to the observation frequency. So just like we were talking about a moment ago, common alias periods are half or two times the true period, or a windowing frequency might be something related to 12 hours or 24 hours, so how you're observing it. So I have two examples here. The left one, this, these are both for asteroids again. The left one is for an incorrect period, 4.1660 hours. This is the correct period. Notice that these are aliases of each other. So the one on the left, we would say, would be an alias of the true period on the right. So it's half of the period. And then last comment here. When you make a period determination, as I've said a couple times, you need to examine the phased light curve and ensure that it makes sense for the type of variable object you're looking at. So for example, these two light curves that I have here, these are for asteroids, but it probably doesn't really matter what they're for. Do they look right? They look a little weird, don't they? There's kind of like almost doubles of each one. And these are slight phase shifts between uh, kind of two sequential times through the, the uh, rotation of the asteroid. And they're not quite lined up right. But they're close enough that you might get, like in your string length minimization method, these might come out as the best one. But they're still not quite right. So you've got to check it by eye and make sure that it makes sense. All right, I think we're at the end here. So we're going to get into the Python notebook next. And how do we access that? You guys got to tell me that. I haven't been here for very long. Yeah. OK, so Igor's coming to tell us how to access this. OK, so have you guys had a chance to get the notebook and get the data files and everything? Yes? OK, you've all had a chance to get those? All right. So what we've got here, you guys have done a bunch of the Python already. So you've got all the intro stuff here for uh, loading your libraries and everything. And so the synthetic light curve. So what we're looking at first is just generating the light curve. So sample light curve. So this is a raw light curve, so unfazed initially. OK, so if you're looking at generating the sample light curve with time, you want to read in the data and just plot it. OK, so this first light curve is just showing a raw light curve, so unfazed. So you can see the time axis here. The x-axis is time and not phase. And so for this light curve, does this look like much of anything? No, but you may be surprised, OK? Now, as we scroll down, if we keep going in the Python notebook, the next one here is phasing it. So this is what we did with the Excel worksheet, but this is going to be more general for you to be able to insert into your coding later on. So in this function called phase fold, so we're phasing it. And the idea of folding, remember the idea that we were, we were talking about chopping up the light curve into segments, the length of your trial period, and overlaying them on top of each other. Folding is another term that's used for that. Okay? So when you do this here, when you use this light curve, and now you fold it and phase it to the trial period, then you can see that we actually have a periodic object here. So that previous lot raw light curve that didn't look like much of anything actually turned out to be something. Can we just scroll up and see that just a little bit here? Yeah. OK, so there we've got the raw light curve. And the reason this looks so messy is it's over a fairly long time period. And the object may not have been observed very many times in one night. 
And if there's gaps in the data, then there's a big change from night to night, so it just looks like a scatter. But then when we scroll down here and we look at the phase fold and then look at it coming out, we can see then the uh, Cepheid light curve here. And so that's a really big difference here. And that's the power of phasing the data. Now, if we scroll down below this, we're going to focus on one of the four, um, excuse me, one of the period finding methods that astronomers use a lot for unevenly spaced data, which is what we've all got, which is the Lone Scargle algorithm. And so this has just the function. You can see the function is called Lone Scargle because that is one that's used uh, traditionally throughout astronomy. And that will be taking your light curve now and decomposing it into the frequencies that have the most power. And so what we look at with this plot then is we want to plot the power and the frequency, or sorry, the frequency and power so that then we can figure out the one that has the most power. And so if we can take a look at that. And so here we have the output from the lone scar algorithm. So it has frequency across the x-axis and then on the y-axis is the power of the spectrum. And so you can see here, this has a frequency, at, or a lot of power at a frequency of 0.5 days. And so that's then telling you the trial period that you want to phase. So what you should do then is take this data and go back up and put it into your phase folding algorithm and phase it to that period and make sure that it looks properly. And that's what this is doing finally in the end of the workbook is we're combining what we've learned together with the phase plotting and the loam scargle and kind of putting that all together. So it's taking your loam scargle algorithm, it's looking for the frequency with the most power, so it's just doing that right out from your algorithm, and then it's uh, folding your data to that period and plotting that data so that you can then take a look at it. So putting all of those things together. Okay, and now, so this is all with a test case, and then we've got some real data here. So I have a data file that I brought, uh, Cepheid. So you can see here the Cepheid one that we worked with. And did we put in the asteroid one here? Is it in? I also brought an asteroid one. So there's no. Cepheid. No. Nobody's, but we have the data file. Yes. We can test so it live. We can actually let them test it. Yes. Test it. So when you step through the workbook, and this all looks good for the Cepheid, this is the same Cepheid we used in the Excel worksheet. Then we also have an asteroid file. I think it's just called asteroid.csv. And you can put that right in there. And the asteroid is not such a nice regular light curve like the Cepheid is. It's a little bit more unusual, not totally weird, but a little bit more unusual that you'll be able to test out. Yeah, so we have, yeah. we have about 20 minutes left. Yes. So I think that it's actually great that it, I thought this would have been much more complicated to do this. Well, no, no, straight, it's, yes. When you explain, it looks quite straightforward. <laughs> so maybe Until you do it, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to have a notebook that has yes, yeah, someone yeah. else is coded. But All right. maybe what we, can do, what we can do now, since we have about 20 minutes, is first of all, try to test uh, what, what you learned with uh, a different type of source. So instead of the Cephade, maybe the asteroid. Yes. And after that, Maybe you can try to look up online some websites that, I don't know if Melissa is familiar with it, I am not, but maybe you will find somewhere where there are entire databases. Yes, oh, actually, yeah. So another one, I'll put a website up here you guys can look at. So go ahead, try the asteroid first, and then I'll put another website up here. You can download some more data. Okay, so this mm -hmm. way you can have now or anytime when you are at home at your own, at your home institution, just download data for sources that you personally find interesting. If they, they could be any sort of star or AGN or whatever, and try to play around uh, with this. So if you've had success working through the notebook with the asteroid, what you can try is going to the uh, AFSA website. So this was something that uh, Igor put up a moment ago, and I think he's doing that here. Yes, the data download website. So here, so basically, and basically from mm -hmm. here. Yep. Then go to data. Just click on data. Uh -huh. And then go ahead and scroll down a little bit. And download data in ASCII form. And that will give you a CSV file like you were just working with. And one of the objects that I would suggest, so you can put in a name there, is a eclipsing binary called Algol. 
And you may have heard of this, Beta Persei. And so Algol has an eclipsing binary system that's been well observed. Uh, this is, AFSO is um, amateur astronomy, a lot of amateur astronomer observations. So it's been well observed by amateurs. And so these two objects are orbiting each other with a, a period of a few days. And so this should be giving you a lot of good data that you will be able to then put into the notebook and try out. Yes. So, so go ahead. Start date. Yes, you could do all of it. You'll probably get a few thousand observations. And then it, it says, how will we contact you? It takes like two minutes to, to uh, get the data to you. And then you'll just be able to save it and download it. Yeah. Ah, that's true. Did people, what kind of rotation periods did you guys get for the asteroid? I'm sorry, say it again. Days, 0.1239 days. OK. Anybody else? Anybody else try it? What did you get? OK, what did you get? Yes. How many are what still working on the asteroid period? Yeah, what yes. What are the rest of you doing? <laughs> <laughs> wake up, wake up. What period did, did you get, through? sir? 1.1. OK, yeah. It, what is it in hours? So asteroids are often, we think about the periods in hours. What would that be in hours? <laughs> Yeah, instead of days. It, the notebook is days, but what is it in hours? 2.974. 2.974. Okay, that is half the period. Remember that asteroids, when they rotate, they will have two maxima, two minima, as you're seeing kind of both ends, both big ends and both small ends of the asteroid. So that's about half the period. Yeah, so it's, it's five point something hours. Yes. Okay, so I hope this was useful for you guys in thinking about uh, figuring out periods for the variable objects that you may be looking at. So you'll be able to try out the Loam Scargle later on and the phase folding as you need it. And so we're going to be wrapping up and moving on to the next segment today. And I think Varun's going to talk here and I'm going to gather my computer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we do have one more little announcement. So there were two interesting targets that we actually observed for the last two days, right? Uh, there was, there were several. One of them, for example, was just for pretty pictures, which was the Dumbbell Nebula. But there were two targets which had potential to give us science returns. What were those? The GRB and the supernova. So this is what we are about to post right now. So everyone, this is probably your first GCN, Gamma Ray Coordinate Network Circular. So I'm going to just read it out. Optical afterglow measurements by Growth India. Uh, we don't quite add 70 co-authors on a GCN, so everyone is not a co-author. Uh, so and uh, here is the main thing that you need to look at. The long duration GRB was observed by the Growth India Telescope in the G band for 600 seconds. Here is the time at which we observed it. It was these many days after the GRB explosion. We measured a G band magnitude of about 20 with an error bar of 0.13. And then I will draw your attention to this line. The data were obtained as a part of the growth winter school at IIT Bombay with 70 participants. And the winter school link is where all of your names are listed. So uh, if you are all ready, should I click send? I think they will ban me from GCNs. Um, what we can do though is that uh, uh, hopefully later today or tomorrow we are going to post an ATEL. And the ATEL editor is right here. So if she gives me a permission to post uh, ATEL with 70 co-authors, we will do that. So everyone ready to post this? Yes. Can we have a countdown? Yes. Five, four, three, two, one, go. There it is, gone. <laughs> uh, I will show it, I will show those details once they come up. It's about, it's about a thousand, right? Yes, but that will come in a couple of minutes, right, after it is sent. So as we, when we return from the tea break, uh, I will show you how many people this message was sent to. 
and uh, it's going to be order of a thousand plus people. So those many people now know about what we did yesterday and day before. Okay, on that note, let's end this session here and we have a tea break and we will resume again at 11.